Welcome to AIN Debrief, where we take a look back at the most important aviation stories of the past week by the AIN editors who covered them. I'm AIN Alerts Editor Chad Trotvetter. In this week's episode, Air Transport Editor Gregory Pollock provides highlights from Boom Supersonics' XB1 demonstrator rollout on Wednesday. Senior Editor Kurt Epstein gives an overview of Honeywell's latest annual business jet forecast. Wichita-based editor Jerry Siebenmark notes the dual FAA certifications received this week by the two business aviation OEMs there in the aviation capital, the King Air 360-360ER at Textron Aviation and Learjet Liberty at Bombardier Learjet. And finally, Carrie Lynch discusses the NBAA Safety Town Hall on Wednesday that recognized the Air Trek pilots that safely landed their Citation 2 after a dual engine failure due to diesel exhaust fluid contamination of their fuel. Let's get started with this week's AIN debrief with Greg on the XB1. So, what's the significance of this rollout, Greg? All right, so Greg, on Wednesday, Boom Supersonic uh, rolled out its XB1 supersonic prototype. Uh, it's a demonstrator. It's not the full size of what their Overture airline will be. So, um, tell us about the rollout and what this means. Well, um, the, it was actually a virtual rollout um, from the uh, factory in Colorado, um, so it was just online. And uh, but it was quite a quite a fancy production, and they did a really nice job, I thought. But um, the the significance really is the fact that this will be the first the first um, real supersonic um, commercial uh, uh, vehicle that will be flown since since the Concorde, really. Um, there'll be a, a single a single uh, pilot and one person in the airplane, um, and they're thinking about. They they say that they're going to be ready to fly it next year sometime. They they haven't been very specific about exactly when, um, but um, the the, uh, the the demonstrators um, capable of flying up to Mach two point two, and I believe up to a thousand nautical miles. Um, although they didn't give a lot of specifics yesterday about it. Um, a lot of what I have here is from, from, uh, research and previous, previous reports, but, um, uh, it, it was, it was, like I said, it was an interesting, uh, uh, exercise and, uh, I guess, uh, we'll find out, you know, how, how real this becomes once, uh, once the year turns and next year comes around. Yeah. And it's all composite. And I guess, uh, one of the things they were, uh, using the demonstrator for is to uh, see how the construction techniques work and if you know if they're if they're uh, replicatable, I guess, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, this is one of the the big differences in in between, I guess, the the nineteen seventies when when the Concorde was being was was in its infancy and and now. I mean, the Concorde was made out of aluminum, and um, that airplane when it did. When it got to altitude and at its, its top speed, it actually expanded by a foot in length. Um, this this airplane with with modern materials, composite materials, won't do that. Um, it's obviously going to be a lot lighter as well and stronger where it needs to be. Um, another interesting thing is that the Concorde needed to have a drooped nose because of its um, its high attitude that it needed to fly at. Um, at supersonic speeds, this this w won't. It's going to look pretty conventional in terms of the nose, uh, but they're going to to be able to see out 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 during landing. They're going to have to use cameras um, rather than actually being able to look out the windows. Hmm. And they're going to start um, ground doing ground testing in in low speed taxi testing in uh, in Denver, and then they're going to, uh, I guess, for high speed and actual flight, they're going to truck it out to California, right? Yeah, that's right. It's going to fly um, over the Mojave Desert and take off from Mojave Air and Spaceport. Um, there's going to be a, uh, uh, the flights will carve a path over the, there's a supersonic corridor uh, stretching across the desert. Um, and then there's a company called um, Flight Research Inc. that will provide a two-seat um, uh, supersonic trainer to serve as a chase plane during the flight test program. Um, and as a matter of fact, boom, sublease is part of, of that company's headquarters to, to support the, uh, test for the XB one. And, um, there's a, there, there's a, um, 
a fully instrumented flight test control room, and uh, they use one of FRI's hangers for uh, reassembly and maintenance of the XP-1. So then these flight tests will culminate in them building the 55-seat overture, and then they expect to start flight testing that in 2025. They haven't picked a, a, a factory or a production plant uh, location yet, though, right? No, there there were some there were some reports last year about um, the possibility of a, of a location in British Columbia, but um, they, they didn't they didn't specify anything yesterday about how that was going. Um, the the uh, the location studies and but they did say that they expect to um, start building the overture in 2022. So there's not a lot of time left before they uh, actually. Um, do uh, solidify some sort of plan. One interesting thing was the fact that they said that uh, Blake Scholl, who is the uh, CEO, mentioned that the factory will would have to have enough capacity for them to build between five and ten airplanes a year, and then later they would add another building um, for to double that amount at some point. But um, yeah, so 2022 would be the the uh, start of of production 2025 would be first flight and then they hope by the end of the decade to to have the thing uh, in service did they address cost and any orders um no but jal i believe and i think it's virgin virgin atlantic are are involved as partners um they uh they've expressed interest anyway in this um but as far as um, cost goes. They they haven't. Uh, not that I know of. I haven't heard of any any uh, list prices or anything like that. But I mean, one of the one of the points that um, Blake Scholl makes is their whole focus is on making travel supersonic travel affordable to the masses, as opposed to the Concorde, which was very expensive to fly on. Um, one of the um, the, one of the points they make is that they think they can get passengers to be able to fly um, on the airplane for 75% less than they did on the Concorde. So how that translates into the actual purchase price, I don't know. Interesting. Well, it's something to watch. Keep an eye out for first flight next year then. Uh, so, Kurt, uh, also this week, uh, Honeywell released its annual um, business jet forecast. So uh, what do they have to say in the forecast? Is it good or bad? Uh, well, given what's going on here, I guess it's as good as can be, which isn't saying much. Uh, it's the 29th edition of Honeywell's annual forecast, and it's traditionally released just ahead of the uh, start of NBAA's annual uh, convention and exhibition, but uh, obviously there is none this year. So as usual, we were given the advanced uh, briefing on it and uh, ahead of its br- uh, release earlier this week. So basically, it was some slight retrenching. Uh, last year, they called for 7,600 business jets, new business jets to be delivered over the next 10 years, worth an approximate $248 billion. And this year, they dialed that back slightly to 7,300 uh, new business jet deliveries worth about $235 billion over the next decade. And obviously, with the slowdown in deliveries this year, it could very well be accounted for by that. But um, they also asked in the survey, which uh, was conducted uh, over starting in July and ended in September, they interviewed about 1,000 operators worldwide, and they added some COVID questions in there, given the, uh, given the timeliness of it. So of that, about 80% of the people uh, surveyed said that they don't expect COVID to um, alter their plans for purchasing aircraft. And of that remaining 20%, most says they'll keep their plan on keeping their airplanes longer. And what that means is they're prepared to ride it out. They don't see this as being the uh, great, um, like in the great global depression of, uh, of more than a decade ago. Uh, they don't see any signs of panic selling. So... They expect the recovery, uh, Honeywell does, anyway, it's analysts, uh, they expect the recovery to uh, 2019 levels, which weren't great to begin with, but they expect that to be within five years. So there could be a couple of lean years going there, but they uh, see it picking up after that and based on uh, their extrapolations of uh, data and economic um, factors and things like that, they see (laughs) a stronger recovery towards the end of that 10-year window. So a little leaner in the first five years and, and more normal or 
a little more heavyweight in the in the past five, right? Yeah, you're going to see aircraft coming online towards the end of that five year period and going into the second half of the decade. You're going to see more aircraft. Uh, but what they see now is um, the way the statistic, the way the survey works is they interview more than a thousand operators worldwide, and those are used to craft the five the first half of the decade uh, based on their plans and the second half of it is based uh, more heavily on economic factors and economic forecasts and things of that nature so <coughs> excuse me what they were gotten was um, over the next five years there's about a 16 percent replacement rate planned globally for the fleet and uh, of those who are planning to buy, 30% of them plan to make their purchase within the next two years. That number is down 5% from last year. They had 35% in last year's survey. And that means that uh, they see some people pushing their purchases a little bit further out into the future. Mm-hmm. So, And North- Honeywell, used, Honeywell does this forecast because they use it internally for their uh, planning as far as uh, production rates and things like that, right? Absolutely. It's become one of the most respected of the surveys in the industry. A lot of them do them, uh, whether they made it internally or not. But Honeywell has decided to make theirs uh, public and have basically pinned uh, pinned it to the NBAA conference each year. And it's, as I mentioned, it's one of the most anticipated. But uh, one of the things they said in North America over the next five years is expected to account for about 64% of global demand. So, and as far as the... Uh, as far as the aircraft size, the large cabin jets are still expected to maintain their uh, their dominant position. Over the next yeah, over the next uh, five years, they picture that the uh, new new um, large cabin segment is expected to account for more than forty percent of the new private jet deliveries and about seventy percent of the value over the next five years. That's followed by the small cabin segment, which is up six points this year to approximately thirty five percent. And then last, the mid-size, about 19%. And those numbers don't necessarily add up to 100. There's some, some percentage points of, uh, of uh, give or take there. Okay, interesting. Thanks, Kurt. And uh, as we see from the OEMs in Wichita, uh, there's no slowdown in um, investing in new, in new airplane types. Right, Jerry? Well, it, it, not necessarily clean sheet airplanes per se, but um, – uh, yeah, Textron Aviation um, announced uh, this week that it's uh, upgraded uh, King Air. The King Air 360, 360 extended range uh, had been awarded FAA type certification. Um, and that, that comes, uh, you know, just they, they announced the airplane originally or the upgraded airplane. Um but- about two Back months ago. August. Yeah. Um, so it, it seems like a pretty quick turnaround. Um, and then uh, and then sort of uh, the, uh, across town, the Bombardier Learjet, um, Bombardier announced that uh, uh, it's uh, Learjet 75 Liberty had, uh, had entered service. Yeah, and let's not forget that Textron is also um – working on the Denali single engine turboprop and also their um, Sky Courier uh, twin engine turboprop. So there's some investment going on there. So um, actually not bad for activity for Wichita for COVID times, right? Uh, clearly. Um, although I will tell you that uh, even with all the development programs underway and upgrades, there's, uh, we, we certainly, um, the OEMs have certainly, uh, felt uh, the effects of, of, of COVID, of, of pandemic, uh, by uh, cutting cutting staff. So Yeah, that's unfortunate. Let's let's talk about the improvements on the uh, King Air 360 and what the Liberty brings. Okay, absolutely. Well, so for uh, the, uh, for the King Air 360, 360ER, uh, some of the new features include the uh, innovative solutions and support, uh, thrust sense, auto throttle, um, and a uh, digital uh, pressurization controller um, that uh, has been integrated into the uh, uh, Collins Aerospace Proline Fusion Flight Deck. Um, Textron said that the cabin altitude of the 360 has been improved by 10% over its uh, predecessor 350i. Um, 
and uh, and they totally revamped the ca- the cabin too, right? Right, a new look, uh, custom built cabinetry, upgraded materials and finishes, and uh, new interior schemes. And likewise, on the Learjet Liberty, it's all about the interior as well, right? Uh, yeah, for the most part. So basically, what they did was they, with the Liberty, they they took out a um, they took out two seats. Um, uh, in the forward section of the cabin, um, and replaced them with a uh, with a ottoman and, and and table, and they kind of call that the executive area. Um, and then they've also um, the Liberty is uh, doesn't have an APU like the the, uh, the standard Learjet seventy five did. Uh, nor does it have the um, uh, exterior lighting. And that's the courtesy lighting, right? Right. But, and they, but they knocked a couple million off the price, though, right? They not. Yes. Yeah. They they have, and and also, as you would expect, uh, the 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 with taking the weight out, I would assume from the from the APU and the and the seats and such that. You know they they've improved the the uh, range of the of the Liberty by about uh, uh, forty nautical miles, and they're they're selling this on the value proposition, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. You can step into a Learjet for a lot less money than you used to be able to. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jerry. Carrie, this week you listened into the NBA Safety uh, Week uh, webinar webinars, I guess. Um, and they had a really interesting segment on the uh, the pilots uh, that lost both of their engines due to a uh, diesel exhaust fluid contamination of their um, of the fuel in their airplane. So, what was that like? What did they have to say? Well, Chad, they um, held what they called a safety town hall on Wednesday, which was the the middle of its virtual safety week. And virtual safety week it comprised. A lot of the activities that would have been at the convention this week had it been held in person, but they moved it all to a virtual format. So there's a um, single pilot um, forum as well as their national safety forum that's been ongoing. So in the middle of this, they held their first ever virtual safety town hall. And during that, they honored these two two pilots, um, Bruce Monnier and Jerry Downs, who flew a Cessna Citation II on, let's see, May 9, 2019, and encountered a dual engine flame out and briefly electronics loss um, from DEF uh, contamination, but they were able to safely land the airplane. And um, they talked about the whole experience of what they went through. And, you know, there were really some. Um, good lessons learned from it. And in fact, their airmanship was, was so noted that they, that Ed Bolin honored them with a brand new award called the MBA above and beyond airmanship award, um, for their actions of the day. And the say, and the town hall had on the likes of John and Martha King and Richard McSpadden from AOPA's air safety Institute, who were just really, really, um, praiseworthy of their actions and of all the things that we could take away from it. Yeah. And of all the crews that would lose an engine, it was kind of fortuitous, I guess. Uh, they were both glider pilots. And I think the uh, pilot flying had actually, um, in some uh, extra, when he had some extra sim time, um, had asked the uh, simulator instructor to simulate an engine out uh, failure, a dual engine out failure too, so he could see how the airplane would would handle, um, and that really helped him a lot too, right? Yes, it, it, you know, it's really um, serendipitous, but it's it's also the safety culture they brought to it that made this such a successful event despite all the obstacles. And I will say, I believe that they were both glider pilots, but I'm not sure about that. I know that Jerry Downs for sure was a glider pilot. He might even own a glider. I'm not so sure about Bruce Monnier, but I will say that Bruce Monnier was the pilot who did request that sim session. He was in a simulator recurrent training. He had some extra time 
And um, instead of just walking away and getting a cup of coffee, he said, let's use this time. Let's try and go through a dual engine out and see what happens. And that was so fortuitous be, and smart because when he went through the actual event and went through the dual engine out, all of a sudden the airplane's acting just the way it was in the simulator. And he said, he, he was actually surprised by that because when he went through the simulator, the way the airplane acted, he thought, you know, this might be a little optimistic in how the airplane's handling. But when it became a real life situation, it, it really did handle that way. And Martha King said, you know, they've done similar type scenarios and the aircraft really do behave like they're supposed to in the simulator. Um, and then, you know, they were both high time pilots. I think, um, Bruce Monnier had something like 4,000 hours. He was the flying pilot, and he was very familiar with the Citation II. Jerry Downs, they were both working for Air Track. Jerry Downs, though, is a uh, reserve pilot for Air Track, and he had had like 10,000 hours total, but he wasn't flying that often for Air Track. And so the two of them didn't pair very often. And um, what made it work, though, is the way AirTrack trains its pilots, there's a standardization. So even when you're swapping out your co-pilots, everybody operates under the same way. So the two of them paired very well. They both were had a very calm demeanor. They talked to each other very calmly throughout the whole thing. They went over every potential scenario, especially on landing. They went, well, what if the landing gear is doesn't doesn't deploy properly, what should we do? So they were prepared for all the different outcomes as they were going down. What they didn't anticipate is, first of all, losing the first engine, but after they lost the first, they didn't anticipate losing the second, and then they didn't anticipate losing electric temporarily, but they managed all three scenarios. Yeah, let's not lose the, fa the sight of the fact that this was a passenger flight too, right? Yes, there were. There was a patient on. It was a me medical flight. There was a patient on board, and two medics with two family members of the patient. And one of the family members was um, very nervous. And uh, Bruce Monnier said before the flight began, he actually sat down with her and promised her a smooth sailing trip because when he looked at the forecast, it all looked good. He didn't anticipate that when they were at 35,000 feet, that all of a sudden the engine would start acting funny and then start to lose power. He didn't anticipate after that, that they would make the decision to divert to Savannah. They were flying, I'm sorry, from Naples to Niagara. So they were flying over the ocean going up the East Coast when, they were, when all this started to happen at 35,000 feet. So as soon as the engine lost power, they made the decision to divert. They notified the medics of their plan, but said, we're going to just land them fine. They knew with one engine, it'd be no big deal, because at that point, only one engine had gone. And so the medics informed the family and said, it'd be fine. What they didn't tell the, the people in the back was that the second engine had went out and, um, or that the electric went out. Um, but they learned that when they got on the ground because they dead stick the landing and without either engine, they couldn't taxi. And the nervous um, flyer was like, why aren't we taxiing? And the medic said, that's because we don't have any engines. <laughs> yeah. And then they just, uh, they waited for a replacement airplane and uh, took everybody up to Niagara after that, right? They sure did. And, you know, by that time, weather had set in. So this poor thing who thought she was going to have a clear flight now had a bumpy flight with weather and they had to, you know, shoot a lower, you know, lower approach to get into Niagara. And when they got on the ground, um, Jerry Downs said she, she, the patient came or the passenger came up to him and said, you know, I still don't like flying on small airplanes, but if I ever have to again, I want you two to be my crew. And she gave Jerry a big hug and he said that made it all worth it. And then the medics dropped the patient off. They came back, they had dinner, they hopped on the plane, they flew home and Jerry said, yep, all in a day's work. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good ending to that story. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks for listening to AI and Debrief. Another podcast episode will air next Friday. In the meantime, Go to www.ainonline.com for the latest aviation news from AIN.